There are three stages in the contribution ladder. Members are the individuals who've been contributing to the Kubernetes project and the code base um, for a while. Reviewers are experienced members of the community who have demonstrated deep understanding of the code and have been actively reviewing and approving code changes to ensure that it aligns the goals of the project. Approvers are the most experienced members of the community. They have earned the trust of the community and through their consistent contribution and um, effort in the community, they have made sure that they have the rights to approve code changes. And in order to get your code merged, you have to convince them and make sure that they are happy with the direction that that particular change is taking. In order to merge a particular PR, you have to go through a code review process. The PR must pass all the automated tests. It includes unit tests, integration tests, and end-to-end -end tests. These tests are there to ensure that the code is functioning and is not introducing any regressions. In addition to that, you have to get an approved and LGTM label. This, may, this is to ensure that multiple stake, six stakeholders take a look at the code and provide their seal of approval. The PRs must be reviewed by at least one member of the community to ensure that the code is well-written, meets the project's guidelines and standards. Once a reviewer has indicated that the PR looks good to them, the PR must be approved by at least one Kubernetes approver. This approver has the authority to approve the code changes and you have to, like I said previously, you have to convince them and make sure that the code changes align with the project's overall direction as well as the SIG's overall direction. It's important to not assume that reviewers and approvers are always available. They're often very, members, very, very busy members of the community and it is prudent to coordinate with them over Slack or SIG meetings. We just discussed the merge process of a PR, but that's overtly sim simplified. It is useful to know that when you're making small changes like bug fixes, changes to end-to-end -to -end tests, or cleanups, maybe start uh, contributing a PR itself makes sense. However, if you're contributing a feature, um, directly submitting a PR is not the right starting point. It's important to make yourself familiar with the contribution process and to ensure that you understand this whole process because it's a structured process to facilitate a proposal, development, testing, as well as the final release of the feature into Kubernetes platform. This process starts from an unstable alpha, goes through to the feature complete beta state, and, and finally to the, to the stable GA state. In order to simplify the process, we have here three stages that, uh, three different repos where you have to make changes. The first one is the enhancement repo. This is the repo where you have to contribute to submit a particular proposal. Then you have uh, the set of PR that you've sub submit, which is made to the Kubernetes Kubernetes repo. This is often referred to as KK. And then you have to finish up by submitting your changes to Kubernetes website repo, which, is, which includes all the documentation related changes and goes to the Kubernetes website. An enhancement issue is used to track the progress of the entire feature. This issue is referred to by the release team and it's important to keep that up to date as, uh, as that's how they track and make sure that the feature becomes part of a particular release. This diagram shows the summary of the contribution process throughout its entire life cycle. The enhancement issue should be updated at every stage, ensuring that, that the first time the feature was introduced and, and every time any update was made to it, that the changes are reflected in the enhancement issue. So what happens at pre-alpha stage? At pre-alpha stage, you, you should determine if the change that you're making is significant or it's a small change. If the change is small enough, you can go ahead and submit a PR, perhaps have a discussion in the community via Slack or SIG meeting. But if the change is significant enough, it means that you have to write something called a CAP. It is to ensure that, um, it is important to ensure that you check with the SIG if 
writing a cap makes sense or the, the change can be made without writing a cap as well. So what is a CAP? CAP stands for Kubernetes Enhancement Proposal. It's a, it's a design document that proposes changes, uh, that captures the proposed changes and put proposed solution for that change. It includes detailed description of the change, the rationale behind the change, the design, implementation plan, as well as production readiness of the feature. It has to be reviewed by the sponsoring SIG and at times another SIG that is collaborating on that particular feature. What are good kept practices? It is highly encouraged that you get involved in the community early. This can be done by clearly articulating, clearly articulating the problem and the proposed solution in the form of a Google document, sharing it via the SIG mailing list or presenting it at any of the community meetings. This is a great way to identify other contributors who are interested in the same problem that you have or a use case and potentially are interested in collaborating in the contribution process. Once we have a general consensus, we move towards writing a CAP. Kubernetes community provides a, a template that can be followed. It has a set of questions that you have to answer to ensure that you're meeting um, the criteria that a particular enhancement proposal requires. An important thing I'd like to highlight here is the production readiness review. This is a part of the CAP template that is used to fill, that we have to fill to capture the impact of the feature. It captures the impact on scalability, reliability, performance of the system, and overall user experience in the system itself. This will be covered in more detail in the subsequent slides. As a quick tip, I'd like to mention that it's important to gather feedback early and at every stage. And this is what helps to drive consensus within the community. Scoping of a cap can often be very tricky. Uh, there's no one size fits all. Caps can be of different sizes. It's important to ensure that the scope of the cap is well-defined, feasible, and it addresses a real world problem. This is what helps increase the chances of the proposal getting accepted and adopted by the Kubernetes community. So what to expect out of the CAP review process? It is a collaborative process that is designed to ensure that the changes uh, in terms of the proposal, the API changes are well designed and aligns with the overall goals of the project. It is important to be responsive to feedback and be willing to make changes. And uh, it could be making changes to the scope of the cap, postponing some components of the proposal to a later stage, to a later cap perhaps. It is all an iterative process. So how did we do it? One of the first features that we contributed to Kubernetes was CPU Manager extension to reject non-SMT aligned workloads. We started by articulating the problem statement and proposing a potential solution, which was to create a new policy in CPU Manager. Previously, we had CPU Manager policy of none and static. When we, when we had a discussion with the community and, and spoke about our potential solution, we, we got input that there are other potential use cases and scenarios where we want to modify CPU Manager behavior as well. And that's when we realized that we have to come up with a better construct of capturing other potential changes. So we came up with a CPU manager policy options that paved the way for many such policy options in the future. Another such proposal that we had was uh, related to the topology aware scheduling use case that we were working on. We wanted to determine a way to get allocatable resources from Kubelet. Uh, in order to do that, we, we thought that we'd introduce a new endpoint to capture this information. But after discussion with the community, we realized that there was already an existing endpoint that could be leveraged for this with some minor modifications. So what are alpha essentials? At this stage, we've managed to get our cap merged. We need to work on the implementation details, identify the key audience members. And when I say audience members, it's to do with who's going to be reviewing your uh, your changes, your PRs, and things like that. It's going to be developers, reviewers, and expert users who have feedback on, on those, that particular feature. 
Again, iterating through the solution is extremely important. Coming up with the minimum viable product as early as possible with some test always helps. And as we go through the contribution process, we keep filling the gaps depending on the feedback we get from the reviewers as well as approvers. In terms of alpha stage preparation, it's important to keep in mind that we have time for API reviews. API reviews can often be a very grueling process and, and requires careful consideration and um, addressing of reviews. So in addition to that, it's important to keep in mind that we might have to circle back to the cap because the implementation might have slightly diverged from what it was previously, as, or rather as it was captured in the cap. So how did we do it? After we had careful consensus and we had uh, gotten to the stage that uh, it was clear for us that we had to introduce CP manager policy options, we, we went ahead and uh, wrote up a minimum viable product with end-to-end uh, -end test, went through the review process, made changes, and essentially with, uh, with addition of end-to-end -end test, there was conf enough confidence in the feature that was introduced and the feature made it into alpha. So once we have gotten the proposal merged, we have relevant PRs merged, the feature has made it into the alpha stage and it's time to celebrate. The next step is to keep iterating over the feature and making sure that it goes through a more stable stage. And, and my colleague here, Francesco, is going to walk us through how the feature goes from beta all the way to GA. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Zwati. So we made it. Our feature is alpha. And now it's time to plan for the next step and to consolidate it. And the next logical step is going to beta. Thank you. So what we should expect from beta? So one of the key uh, factors I would like to highlight is that feature in Kubernetes, they are guarded by the feature flag, which basically enables are them or not, and in which cases. So in alpha stage, the features are disabled by default, so people interested in to want to try them out, to experiment that, opt in. When a feature is promoted to beta, the, the, that flag is, is turned on by default. So everyone is exposed to them, and you still have the option to turn off the non-stable feature in your cluster, or if you run into issue, you can disable them, but still, you need, to, you need to be aware that the, the, the feature flag is enabled by default and that your, your code is now exposed to a much broader, much broader audience. This, however, is, um, is changed in 124 cycle for REST APIs. So REST APIs beta, so the one uh, exposed by the API server, they are no longer enabled by default. So if your change involves uh, changes to the uh, REST APIs, you may want to check it out, the changes introduced in the cap link here, and make sure you are prepared for. And another thing which is very important to highlight when we plan the, change, the promotion to beta of our feature is that we will need to make sure that the API review is addressed because this and the get, is getting more and more uh, detailed as the feature matures. And it's also that the production readiness review, which we mentioned already a few times, has been performed and all the criteria are met. And when we go beta, we, it, we really need to have some coverage with respect, from end-to-end -end tests to make sure that the behavior, of the, the behavior we're introducing or changing is tested and doesn't break in the subsequent releases. At each stage on which we move forward our feature, we mature it, we need to make changes to the cap which documents the state of a feature and make sure that the state is updated. And at very least, we need to make change uh, to change the latest version which we're working on the feature, but we also need to address a bunch of questions regarding the production readiness and the robust, which it boils down to the robustness of a feature and how it fits in the larger project ecosystem. And since we are changing the cap, it's a, good it's a very good chance, and we actually encourage to reevaluate the cap, making fixes and address the feedback we gathered so far. So the thing that uh, I really want to highlight is that when we promote to beta, we are, we are, uh, the feature is recognized its maturity and its scope and relevance, and so the feature flag is enabled by default. So this is a recognition of 
gained maturity of, of, of such a feature. But it is also a responsibility because now everyone is potentially exposed to this feature and we need to make sure that uh, the stability and the quality criteria they are met. And of course we build on those criteria, we build on, the, on, on those items to make sure we, we have a good GA feature. And to make sure that those criteria are met and the, and the stability and the quality of the feature is up to the expectations, this is what the production readiness review. So it's time now to really spend a few words about the production readiness review. What is this about? The production readiness review, basically, it's a way to make sure that our feature, the work we are doing, conforms to the standards of we, we all expect about a Kubernetes feature. And that uh, review is done by a different set of people with respect to the reviewers coming from the SIG, which is sponsoring and assisting you in, in making your change and in introducing your, your feature. And this, set, this different set of reviewers, they are they own different set of things they look for, and all, all this process goes side by side with the growth of the feature in, in, in the respect of the, from the SIG perspective. So all, all those concerns, they are addressed while the feature grows in, the, in, in respect of the um, direction set by SIG. And as, as more, of course, as you would expect, as more the feature matures, the requirements are higher and higher. And what those requirements are about? They are about uh, Actually, the things we want, really, we, we want for our code, which is about, for example, are there any upgrade constraints? So you need to meet some some criteria, criteria to upgrade, or is it no, no, no extra dependency added? Or how do you roll back? Should you need to roll back? Are there any constraints or any issue you can run into? How the, our, your, uh, your, our feature scales mean? Does it uh, impose extra requirement to existing scalability? Is the scalability addressed when we design and implement our feature? How we can monitor them, make, hey, how we can make sure this works at all or is working for us? And, and how uh, do we, are we introducing new dependencies with, with, to external components or between existing components of, of the Kubernetes? All of those things and more, they're concern of the production readiness review. But the good thing, the very helpful thing is that all the production readiness questions and concerns, they are part of the CAP template. So we can review them ahead of time and plan for them and know what's expected from our feature, from our code in advance and uh, incorporate them in our planning and in our work ahead of time to make sure we are well prepared for. In our case, when we graduate to beta, the, our, the CPU manager extension uh, we are talking about, one thing which we want to highlight is that um, promoting these, those um, extra knobs, those extra options to the CPU manager component of the kubelet uh, in the existing flow of graduation process used to meant that each of those fine detail knob you should be guarded by the feature flag. But during the production readiness review and engaging with reviewers, we kind of figured out that this is Okay, this is following process, but it is too detailed. So we thought about uh, an, an, a different approach for this specific use case, and we basically um, figured out that we can reverse the, the, you know, turn the table and say, okay, we have a set of feature gates which grade the maturity of a knob, and this knob moves toward those stages instead of the other way around. And this serves better these use cases, this use case, and that emerged during, that emerged during the review. And that novel approach was a, 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 useful, a very useful byproduct of, those, uh, of this uh, uh, production readiness review. And another thing I want to highlight that we leverage the fact that we added as early as possible the end-to-end -end test to gain confidence in the soundness of the feature and the robustness of the feature. And during the beta graduation, we improved that end-to-end -end test support, but we build on top of that. In the other, case, on the other use cases, we are mm, describing in the pod resources and point to gain insight about how kubelet assigned resources to workloads. The better stage was gathering, uh, gathering feedback and addressing implementation issue, issues and iterate over the, the existing test suite and increase it as, as much as we could to make sure all the use cases were covered. So kind of straightforward in that case. When we meet all the criteria, we have our feature which moves, moves to beta and we can be happy about itself and celebrate a bit, but not, af not long afterwards, we start the planning to, hey, we want to move it to GA and make it stable and available for everyone. 
GA. What would, would uh, we expect from GA? Basically, what you would expect from any software component in Kubernetes specific case, we want to highlight that the audience is always on for everyone. Of course, you expect the GA feature to be stable, to have no ill effects, and of course, you expect to easily detect, hey, how is this working? Are there any errors? How do I know this is working on my cluster? How do I know this workload is consuming my feature or if it needed? And you expect a smooth path for upgrade, like no issues or at the very least they're well documented. And you expect that if that feature goes deprecated for whatever reason, there is a path and a way forward to cover your use case. And of course, uh, you, you also expect that we have guarantees about the behavior and the end-to-end -end test, we, we need to add in beta. They are more and more important now because they check the behavior of a feature and we're going to double click on them in a, in a few slides. Again, when we change the maturity level of feature, we update a cap to reflect the latest uh, version which we changed our code and to address the latest batch of uh, production readiness review to make sure, okay, this is really stable, this is really meets the expectation. And again, if there is any feedback to be incorporated and any changes to make to align what happened so far, it's a great chance to make them. So we mentioned the end-to-end -end test a few times and let's just spend a few words about them. So the end-to-end -end test, what quick, quick primer, the end-to-end -end test basically they observe the the, the test the behavior of the system, kind of like a black box. You have your system under test, you send the input, very similar to what a user will do, and you observe your output in terms of observable behavior of the system. So those are the closest to the user flows. And this is why they are so important and required to actually graduate and to have a, a really good pulse of, the, of how the feature is doing. But because they test the full system, for example, you may need to have a full cluster to test your feature. And in CI, in test environment, you may need to bring up a full cluster with all the components. So that is, is expensive and could be fragile in CI environment. So the trade-off here is that we need those tests. We want those tests to make sure the feature is behaving as per spec, but those are costly. So there is a trade-off to be made about how early you introduce. From our perspective, I, I say the earlier, the sooner the better, and how much of them we want, because again, they are costly. It's, they sit at the very top of the pyramid, but the top could be a flat top, let's say. So, from end-to-end -end test perspective, they are, yeah, they are so important. They are so needed from beta and much more from GA. And since we depend on them, the least, I mean, the worst thing you can, you can happen to them is to have them flaky. What, what's a flake in the context of end-to-end -end test? A flake is an intermittent failure. So you test your feature, you test your code, you run your test in CI, red. Mm. I run it again, no changes, just run it again, it becomes green again. So what happens? That with what we call a flake. So all of a sudden you don't know anymore. Okay, was the test environment somehow broken or set up failed for whatever reason? Is, there is a bug in the test, there is a bug in the code, you don't know. The flake add uncertainty, and this is why they're bad for the, for the signal or the quality of a feature. And this is why it's so important to invest in, in to keeping them healthy, to keep, keeping them healthy to make sure we don't have flakes and we can trust on them. So it's a challenge, of course, everyone knows that, but that also means we need to plan for that investment to stick around to make sure to maintain those tests to, make, to keep the confidence we gain, we are hard earned uh, about our feature. And it's also very good practice to keep watching the CI signal. If there are too many flakes, for some degree of too many, we need to check them and go back and fix them to make sure our, our code works as intended. So in our case, in our case, we contributed to the graduation of some long time beta feature in the, in the, score, in the, in the context of the kubelet. So we have those resource manager which, which um, assign exclusive resources to the, to the workload, for, for example, for exclusive CPU, for memory, or for devices, and they were beta for a long, long time, in, up until very recently. And that was also good because the code was stable. We, okay, some bugs from time to time, mostly stable, and people start to depend on that, but still those features were beta. And that was what we called perma-beta, when it tend to stick to permanently being beta, which is bad, because again, 
the code is there, the feature is there, it works, but it's not really, we don't have full commitment yet. So this is why the, the SIG, the SIG node, uh, made this initiative to, okay, let's start to fix the perma beta in which we contributed to. And the, the key thing, the takeaway, the challenge here was about, uh, um, first of all, um, bringing up to date the caps and, and, the, and which were using old templates in, in often times, which because those features were better for a long time. So bringing them up to speed with the recent standard of the caps, and in some cases address a bunch of extra peer uh, production readiness review, or even in some cases address the production readiness at all retrospectively because the feature rate was better for so long. So production readiness was very, not really a thing back in time, which were more informal, let's say. And another interesting case study for us is the pod resources GA, so the, the API we use to peek into the kubelet uh, resource assignment, which we tried to GA in 27 and didn't make it. But this is very interesting, because the reason why it didn't make it. It didn't make it because we had to, uh, to address and fix and meet the requirement for some, in some areas which weren't there because the cap was kind of old, so it's good. It's good that the review addressed and highlighted those missing requirement, and it's good that we addressed them. And the fact that the, 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 the feature didn't make a GA in 27, it's actually good because now we meet those criteria. And those criteria, I want to highlight two key examples. The first example is the multi-platform support for Windows because, well, at least me, sometimes tend to believe, hey, it's all Linux, but Windows, it's also, I think it's supported by the, the, the platform, so we want to have that support. And the only challenge was that was added a bit later than the proper process would have expected, but still we made it. And during the production readiness review, we also identified a, a room for an improvement area, which is limiting the access to that API endpoint to make sure consumers don't consume too much, let's say, so rate limited. And this is again which went through during the production release review and the fact that those points were highlighted greatly increased the robustness and the quality of the future. And when we make all of that, we reach GA, so we are happy and done because our work is done and everything we planned back in time is now delivered, so we are done. Well, we are done if that's actually it. So in some cases, it's not the case. There is follow-up work, for example. Well, at the very least, despite all the huge amount of effort we put into all the guidance, all the help, software have bugs, so we may want to stick around to make sure that now that GA is exposed to everyone, everywhere, there are no bugs, so we stick around and look for them and fix them, monitor the status for some time. We may also very much want to build on top of the, the good feature, the good work we, we integrated. So how do we do that? Well, it's simple. We start a, a new cap process or new contribution process from the beginning, and down the platform incorporates all the good work we did so far. So could we have some traits which come across all this process, which, you know, are kind of the, the guideline all across this process. Yeah, there, there are a few, and the few which I think possibly among the most important are the communication side of things. We already mentioned that in the beginning, and it's worth mentioning again now. So the Kubernetes project invests a lot, and I mean a lot of energy and resources to make sure it's welcoming, it's documenting, it's open. Let's take a Simple example, when you submit a change during using the GitHub process, there is the bot which welcomes you, guides you, thinks, hey, what, this is what you expect, this is what you could do, this is the document you can review, this is the people you get, get in contact with, and all of that is a huge help. But to make things even more straightforward and actually faster for your process, join the community, saying hi, and listen to them, and interact with the community, and be an active community helps a lot and makes things faster and smoother for you as well. And the other thing is that this is a very detailed, multi-step span process which could span across months and sometimes years with you know everything which happens in between and all the availability of people. So be persistent and pushing through and trusting the community is again something that helps like a lot to make sure things happen for good in the long term. 
As a parting thought, I just want to mention that it's really important to take initiative. Kubernetes is where it is today because of its contributing members and all the people who've been putting in hard work. If you feel that you're not sure how to contribute, we already went through the communication channels and ways to contribute in the community. Every way that you contribute is helpful. There are plenty of opportunities. You can start by triaging issues, writing up cleanup PRs, end-to-end -end contribution tests, um, as well as help in deflaking some end-to-end -end tests. Contributions in every shape and form are always welcome. And we are all constantly looking for new members of the community. If you have questions, you can reach us out on Signode Slack channel. Um, and we'd be happy to answer any of your questions. I think we've run out of time, uh, so we'd be happy to take questions after the talk. Um, we'd be here for 10, 15 minutes. And thank you for joining Thanks us for today. Coming. Enjoy the rest of KubeCon.